Hello all, and welcome to the next video in our Introduction to X-ray Diffraction series. This is Chapter 2, Part 4, and it covers lattice planes. First up, let's set up just four simple cubic unit cells here, and down here you'll see my axes. It's always important when determining lattice planes to show which axis system you have chosen. So let's take this point as our origin. I've just arbitrarily chosen it. And let's look at this plane of atoms. Well, when identifying planes, we use HKL in parentheses, and these are called Miller indices. Now, Miller indices are the reciprocals of the fractional intercepts which the plane makes with the crystallographic axes. Now, when we are identifying these Miller indices, it's important to remember that H corresponds to the x-axis, K to the y-axis, and L to the z-axis. So this plane here intercepts the x-axis at 1, and then it never touches the y or z axes. We have to give some sort of number to that, so we say that this plane crosses the y and z axes at infinity. To then get our plane designation, we take the reciprocals of these values. 1 over 1 is 1, 1 over infinity is 0, so that gives us the 1, 0, 0 plane. Now if we move our origin back one atom, and then highlight this plane of atoms, we see that it is also the 100 plane. So really, when people talk about the 100 plane, it can be just a single plane, if we are just looking at one unit cell, or if we have many unit cells, it can be the equivalent plane, depending upon which atom we choose to pick as our origin. So it could be this plane here that's highlighted in red, this plane here, even this back plane here, this one, so on and so forth. Now let's see what happens if we have a base-centered cubic unit cell, and we identify the plane that goes through these new atoms. Well, now the new plane crosses the x-axis at one half. It still never touches the y and z axes, so those are still infinity. We take the reciprocals of these values, and we get that this is the 200 plane. Let's look now at a feature of planes that differentiates from directions. So if we have the 0, 1, 0 planes, that basically corresponds to these two in this cubic unit cell. If we have the 0, 2, 0 set of planes, it contains those same planes, but additional planes. It's for this reason that we do not reduce our 0, 2, 0 plane designation by dividing it by 2 to get it into the least common integers, like we did with the directions, because 0, 1, 0 is not the same as 0, 2, 0. The same thing applies if we had the 1, 1, 1 planes and the 2, 2, 2 planes. Because these two features are determined differently, planes and directions, we do not reduce their numbers the same way. So let's work at identifying some different types of planes. This one here, we see that it crosses the x-axis at 1, y-axis at 1, and the z-axis never, so infinity. We take our reciprocals and we get the 110 plane. And just to highlight it, we also have many other 110 planes in these four unit cells. Here we have one that's a little trickier. It crosses the x-axis at 1 half, y at 1, and z at 3 fourths. So there are our intercepts. We take the reciprocals, we get 2, 1, and 4 thirds. Now, just like with directions, we do want all of our indices to be integers, so we need to multiply all indices by 3 in order to get the 6, 3, 4 plane. One more feature that applies to the cubic crystal system. 
is that if we have a plane, here we have our 0, 1, 0, the 0, 1, 0 direction is normal to that plane, which we can see here as well for the 1, 1, 1 plane, our 1, 1, 1 direction goes perpendicularly through that plane. This is just something to keep in mind. It's a feature unique to the cubic crystal system, but it helps, I think, with picturing uh, the relationship between planes and directions. Now, just like with directions, the hexagonal crystal system is a little bit different from the others. So here we have just another hexagonal crystal system um, I can use for illustration purposes. Non-hexagonal lattices have three Miller indices, whereas hexagonal can have a fourth, just like with directions but they're determined a little bit differently in this situation. We have our two A lattice parameters with 120 degrees between them. Our C lattice parameter is different and is at 90 degrees from both the A lattice parameters. Now we can make these two A lattice parameters a little different in naming, not in length. We can call them A1 and A2 and then we can make another axis label here in this direction and call it A3. And I'm going to say that A3 is positive in this direction. So this would be the positive one position for A3. So this all results in Miller-Bravais indices, whereas before we just had Miller indices. And now we have H, K, I, and L where i is simply the negative sum of h and k. So the best way to illustrate this is to just show some examples. So let's take this plane here. We see that it crosses the x-axis at 1, the y-axis at negative 1, and it never touches z. So our h, k, and l values are 1, minus 1, and infinity. When determining the Miller-Bravais lattice, we have uh, these three that we know, and then the i that we don't. So currently we have one, one bar, i, and zero. Well, i is simply found by the negative sum of h and k. So that gives us zero. So we have the one, one bar, zero, zero plane. And this makes sense because if we look over here, this plane never touches this axis, just like it never touches the z axis. So it makes it zero. So let's now look at this plane. It crosses the x-axis at negative one, the y-axis at one half. Once again, it never touches the z-axis, so those are our intercepts. We can determine i as shown, and we get that this is the one bar, two, one bar, zero plane which once again makes sense because this plane is crossing the A3 axis down here at negative one. Looking at this one, it crosses X at one, it never touches Y, and it crosses Z at one. There's our intercepts. And we can find I, that's also negative one. So we have the one zero, one bar one which again makes sense because it crosses this axis at negative one. So that's how we use the four axes for identifying planes in the hexagonal crystal system. Now, just like with directions, we can have families of planes, and these are planes that are related by symmetry. Now, for cubic lattices, where A equals B equals C, if we are looking for the 100 family of planes, which is designated by these types of brackets, we see that the 100 planes, both positive and negative, equal the 010 planes and also equal the 001 planes by symmetry. All of our distances are the same. So these six planes make up the 100 family of planes for the cubic system. Now let's take this cubic system, extend the z-axis so that we have a tetragonal system. Well, now A equals B, 
but they do not equal C. So when we look for the 100 family of planes, we still get that the 100 planes equal the 010 planes. That spacing from one plane to the next is the same. But when we look at the 001 planes, that's now different. So then we find that these two planes are not related to these other four planes due to symmetry. So then those last two go away and these make up our 100 family of planes for the tetragonal crystal system. We have one more feature to look at for planes in this video, and that is D spacings. Just as a reminder, here we have some 100 planes, here we have some 110 planes, and if we take a top down view of these, we see the spacing from one plane type to its next nearest neighbor. Same thing here. Now this distance is what we call a D spacing. So that is the distance from one plane to the next nearest neighbor of the same type. And we see that these have different distances. And we designate it by putting a small d and then the subscript is whatever plane we're looking at. For the cubic system, which has a equals b equals c, alpha equals beta equals gamma, which is 90, here is the equation for calculating the d-spacing. So we need to know which hkl plane we want to determine the d-spacing for, and also the lattice parameter. Let's just make up something. We'll say that we are looking for the 110 d-spacing, and that our lattice parameter is 2.5 angstroms. For the cubic system, it's rather straightforward. We calculate 1 over d squared, we can plug in our h, k, l, and our lattice parameter, and then just solve basic math. We get our d squared. We can find the d. 110 is 1.77 angstroms. Now, as we lose symmetry, the equations start to get a little bit more complicated. For tetragonal, a equals b, which does not equal c. So now we have to have a little bit more of an equation here on the right-hand side. We split apart the H and K, that goes with the A, L goes with the C. Here we will pretend that we are looking for the 102 D spacing. We'll say that A is four angstroms, C is five angstroms. We'll take our equation, plug in all of our values, go through the basic math and solve that we have a D spacing for the 102 plane of 2.12 angstroms. Here you see the D spacings for most of the crystal systems. We already went over cubic, tetragonal. You see once we hit orthorhombic where A does not equal B does not equal C. All three of the indices are split apart with their respective lattice parameters. Hexagonal, things get a little bit more complicated because our gamma is no longer 120. And then once we start hitting rhombohedral and lower symmetry, things get a lot more complicated. It's not quite so easy to calculate out the D spacing. And then once we hit the triclinic crystal system, it gets incredibly complicated. So here's the equation for the D spacing of the triclinic system. But this V is the volume of the unit cell, which is this entire equation. All of these S values, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and so on, they have their own equations down here. So you can imagine if you plugged all of this into this equation up here, it would get incredibly long and very easy to make a mistake by just plugging in values. But this shows you how much uh, having a high degree of symmetry simplifies calculations. In summary, determining plane indices, they are HKL in the middle of parentheses, and these are the Miller indices. You find the Miller indices by taking the reciprocals of the fractional intercepts, which the plane makes with the crystallographic axes. Families of planes are all planes that are equivalent due to symmetry. 
With the hexagonal crystal system, we have four indices, and we get that fourth one, which is I, and it sits between K and L. That is simply the negative sum of H and K, and corresponds to this axis here. Finally, D spacings are distances from one plane to the next nearest neighbor of the same type. And we just went over all of the different equations for the different crystal systems. As always, Gus and I thank you for watching, and we hope you have a great day.